think of a time in your life that perhaps something sounded really good and you were really excited about it and sat, thought that really sounds interesting or exciting, but the longer that something went on, the more you realized it wasn't quite going to turn out the way that you anticipated. Perhaps it was a new job. Perhaps you came in and you thought, oh my goodness, this is going to be wonderful and all sorts of opportunities and, and ways for you to be involved in different things and, and you realized it just didn't quite pan out that way. Or, or maybe you moved somewhere and you thought, oh, if I move here, now I'm set and this is going to be just a wonderful adventure. And yet, as the course of time goes on, maybe it wasn't quite all that you had made it out to be in your thoughts and in your dreams. Uh, I was thinking of that as I was watching uh, a clip of a TV show, and I'm going to date myself here, but if you're my age, late 30s, early 40s, perhaps you remember a TV show that was on Saturday mornings on NBC called Saved by the Bell. Does anyone remember that? Uh, it ran for about four years, and this TV show, uh, it was a, a, a comedy. It was about these kids in this fictional high school in California and all the adventures they had. And I remember watching that. I would watch that on Saturday mornings, and then after that, I would watch my NBA show, Inside Stuff with Ahmad Rashad, and get caught up on the NBA for the week. But that show, when I was in junior high, I would have been a fifth grader when that show started, and then sixth grade, that made high school look so fun. There was dances every week. You'd go in between classes, or immediately after school, you'd go to this restaurant called The Max and hang out with your friends and eat french fries and drink pop and do all these things. And because it was a TV show, that was always some big, exciting adventure taking place. And I remember thinking, man, I can't wait to go to high school. High school is going to be awesome. Uh, apparently, they had dances every week and all sorts of exciting things and homecoming four times a year. I don't know. It... And you know what? I really enjoyed high school, and I had a lot of great times and a lot of great friends and a lot of opportunities, but I quickly realized that that was nothing quite like what the TV show had offered. And so if I was basing my experience solely off of that TV show, I was going to be a little disappointed. There are times in life where maybe we've got some expectations for how things will turn out, and yet it doesn't go that way. And I think of that because I think so many times we are disappointed in things or people, uh, political campaigns. If you vote me in, I will do this for you. And then what ends up happening? Uh, those politicians can't fulfill every single promise they've made on the campaign trail. And so then they say, well, it didn't work out. Or they blame the opposition and whatever and, and say, well, that just kept me from doing that. All of these times that we've been promised things by people and it doesn't quite match up to our expectations, that should make this season of Epiphany stand out all the more to us, I think, because the more that we learn about Jesus and the more that we see how he reveals himself to the disciples and whether it was how he was revealed uh, very early on in his earthly life to Mary and Joseph and to the wise men, the Magi, as they came, or it was how he revealed himself at the wedding at Cana, or how he was revealed uh, at his baptism and that voice from heaven. Or even now, we read of an event, a significant event, called the Transfiguration. And we see just a continual building, a continual revealing of who Jesus was. And there was never disappointment. There was never uh, all Jesus. We didn't think it would be like that. They were in awe, absolute awe. And so we're going to look this morning at Matthew chapter 17. And I'm going to read verses uh, 1 through 13. So we read of this event. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with them. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And he was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. 
And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Then why do the scribes say that Elijah must come? And he answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. Uh, This is a significant text, a significant text, I believe, because it helps us to continue to see that Jesus is really something special, uh, that Jesus does indeed have the blessing, the approval of God the Father. But then there's a description, too, even in the testimonies that are given there of Moses and Elijah being there. We're going to look at that in just a minute here. Do you know what happens here? And so in chapter 16, the context that we see immediately before this is uh, Jesus is with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and they are demanding signs of him. Jesus, do this. Do this and prove that you are the Son of God. And then Jesus uh, has Peter confess that he is the Christ. Jesus asked that question, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus begins to speak of his upcoming death and resurrection and all that will happen and what it really means to be a Christian. And in the midst of all of that then, Six days later, Jesus is up on the mountain with Peter and James and John. And they're there by themselves. And all of a sudden then, this transfiguration appears. It reveals the glory of God. I was reminded of, of uh, one of the texts that we, I had read this Advent season back in late November and December from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 5. The promise is given that the whole earth will see the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so this promise of the glory of God being revealed. And it had been revealed in a number of ways in the Old Testament. Think about when the uh, Israelites were going through the wilderness for those 40 years. God's glory was revealed even as the sea opened and God's people were allowed to pass through. God's glory was revealed In the temple, there is that Shekinah glory, that glory of uh, being in the presence of God. There was the glory that the people knew occurred when Moses went and spoke to the Lord. And he had a glow, a glow that would be like if uh, someone was in Florida or Arizona for three months and comes back to, to South Dakota in about early April when the rest of us haven't hardly seen any sun and they are just as tan as can be. They have a glow and and, and they stand out from all the rest of us. Moses had this glowing, not because he'd been in Arizona or Florida, but because he'd been in the very presence of the Lord. That was a reminder of the glory of God. And so we get bits and pieces of that in the Old Testament, but here we see it revealed in quite a significant way. Jesus' transfiguration Uh, This is the only time that we believe that Jesus revealed his glory in this way while he was on earth. And so we're going to look at the first truth here today, uh, the importance of Jesus revealing his glory. What did that mean? Well, first of all, I think it, it speaks of his divine glory that's made visible. He'd made these claims to the disciples, but you know, when Jesus was just a little baby and the wise men came, I don't want to be mean, but Jesus probably just looked like the average child. We see these paintings and depictions where the Christ child is in a manger and he's got a halo and the glow is around him. Uh, Maybe wasn't the case. 
Jesus would have looked like an ordinary man. And that's exactly why so many people said, well, now, wait a minute. You're claiming to be the son of God. You look just like one of us. Or those in Nazareth and Galilee would say, Jesus, I grew up with you. You know, I've known you for years. I didn't think there was anything special about you. And you're claiming to be the son of God, the Messiah. Here we have Jesus' divine glory being made visible. And really, it was quite ironic here in the timing because that humble Christ would soon endure the depths of humiliation, of being arrested and betrayed and being put on a cross. Jesus' divine glory was made visible here. And the word that's used here for transfigured is the same word that we get. Uh, The word in Greek is the same word that we use in English for metamorphosis. And think about metamorphosis when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. It's a change on the outside that comes from the inside. And so here what we have is that the glory of the Lord was not reflected like it was on Moses. Moses was shining because he'd been in the presence of God. But here, this glory of Jesus was a change that came from within as he allowed his essential glory to shine forth. And I think we've got the verse here on the screen from Hebrews 1.3. Put that up. Yeah. Here's the description of the writer of Hebrews as he speaks of Jesus. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And so there's that description of Jesus, the Messiah, as the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint. You know, if you were to make a a plaster face for a mask and you would make that, that would be an exact imprint. And that's the exact description there, that wording. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God the Father, the exact imprint in his nature. That's why Jesus says, no one can see God the Father unless they come through me. I and the Father are one. And so what was the purpose here of the transfiguration? And why were Moses and Elijah there? Were they there to encourage Jesus and to say, hey, you're, you're on the right track. Keep pressing on. Uh, that's possible. Um, but I think in light of the context here and of our reading, that it was to strengthen the faith and witness of the disciples and to help them realize that this Jesus He's exactly who he says he is. There's no disappointments. There's no misunderstanding. There's no letdowns. There's no empty promises. What Jesus says that he is and what he will do is exactly what he will fulfill and accomplish. And it was two weeks ago that we looked at the baptism of Jesus. And we looked at that as recorded in Matthew chapter 3. And here we see Uh, This transfiguration serves as a bookend, if you will, a fitting conclusion to Jesus' earthly ministry. As we are nearing the end of Epiphany season and just really a matter of weeks away, two weeks away from beginning the Lenten season, the transfiguration serves to help us to see Jesus for who he truly is, and it's made quite clear in our lesson today. And the disciples needed that because they were slow to catch on. And I, I made reference of that before uh, in last week's sermon about how the disciples were so slow to catch on sometimes. And we see that even with Peter. Peter desi- desired to build shelters for all three. And really, that probably wasn't a bad idea because there's Jesus, and then there's Moses, and there's Elijah talking with Jesus. And the disciples were were dumbstruck. They didn't quite know what to do with all of this, we read in the other gospel accounts. And so finally, Peter says, well, would it be good if I built three tabernacles, three places to worship and honor each one of these men here? And really, uh, Moses and Elijah, if you're going to have a Mount Rushmore to honor the, the great leaders of the past in the history of Israel, Moses and Elijah would be on that list. And so we're going to look and see uh, what the significance was behind the testimony of Moses in verse 3. Can we go to that second truth on the screen? Uh, The testimony of Moses. Uh, And what would the importance be of having Moses there? What do we know about Moses? Moses was a great leader. 
Moses was one, as we read earlier, who had been in the presence of God. God spoke to him. He led the Israelites out of Egypt, and he delivered his people from bondage. He was the giver of the law. And he was a leader for 40 years in the wilderness. And Moses wrote the Pentateuch as he was led by the Holy Spirit. He wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Moses was a great leader and a great prophet. And so oftentimes, as the Jewish leaders spoke of God's word, they said, well, what did Moses say? What would Moses say about this? And here we have Moses. They are present with Elijah and Jesus. In the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 3, we read about how Jesus is greater than Moses. And even that word was given to Moses and the people in Deuteronomy 18.18 18, to prepare that God would raise up a leader even greater than Moses. Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, the Lord says, I will raise up a prophet like you from among their brothers and I will put my words in his mouth. So for the people were to think, well, Moses is a good leader, but what happens when he gets too old or what happens when he passes away? There was a promise. God said, I will raise up even a greater leader. And that wasn't just speaking of Joshua or David or any other leader, but ultimately looking forward to Jesus. And in Hebrews 3, 5, and 6, we read about how Christ is greater than Moses. And the de description that's given is just as the one who built the house is greater than the house itself recognizing that Jesus is the overall encompassing blessing that God longed to give his people and that Moses was a great leader and a fine leader, but all that Moses spoke to and all that he did foreshadowed and pointed the people to the work of the Messiah. And so that was the testimony of Moses. And then there's the testimony of Elijah, Elijah, the great prophet. And do you remember, perhaps some of you were here several years ago when we had... Um, Jeff Siegel, and he did a Jewish Passover meal. And there was an empty chair at the Passover table. And it wasn't for a, a loved one who was missing. It wasn't for someone who was running late. But that empty chair was left there for Elijah the prophet to come and sit and be a part of that meal. And there was a great expectation that in the end times when the Messiah would come, he'd be ushered in by the prophet Elijah. Elijah never died. Recall, he went off in a chariot and rode into heaven. And he was a mighty prophet. He performed great miracles. He called down fire from heaven on Mount Carmel. And he raised the widow's son from the dead. And so the Jews always had this in their mind that Elijah would be the great prophet who'd come at the end to show that God was really going to take care of business. Jews thought he would come to usher in the kingdom of the Messiah. And so with that understanding of Moses and Elijah, you can see why Peter then would perhaps say, well, what do we do here? We've got three really important people, Moses and Elijah and Jesus. But we see that Peter perhaps spoke out of turn. For verse 5 says, He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased Listen to him. Listen to him. The focus was on who? Elijah? Moses? No, the focus was on Jesus. And it's interesting to note, after that voice and after the disciples heard this and fell on their faces, they were terrified, who was the only one left? Jesus. Moses and Elijah were gone. This wasn't about Moses and Elijah. This was showing that really Moses and Elijah paled in comparison to the glory and the majesty of Jesus. And so that's the fourth truth that we see in this passage in verse 5, the significance of that voice from heaven. It was a testimony, not of Moses, not of Elijah, although wouldn't it have been interesting? I don't know if they said anything to the disciples. Wouldn't that be interesting to know what they would have said? Or if the disciples were just too dumbstruck and terrified to even ask any questions? I think I would be stammering. I wouldn't quite know what to say. I'd be a bit of a mess. But that voice from heaven, the testimony was from God the Father. Three people were there and seen, but only one was recognized by God. And after that voice had finished speaking, 
And the disciples opened their eyes and looked around. Only one remained, Jesus. And that voice from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. If it sounds familiar, it's because it's the exact same thing that Jesus said when John the Baptist, when John the Baptist baptized Jesus. Why would Jesus have that have repeated twice? I believe there was a, a, a strong uh, repetition uh, uh, reminding the, the people this man just wasn't making these claims on his own, but that it was the voice from heaven speaking to them. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one else but only Jesus. Uh, I think there's an interesting application there, isn't it? Uh, that perhaps when we are terrified, we have no idea where to go or what to do, that we come to Jesus and he speaks to us and he assures us and in his glory, in his might, in his power, in his majesty, he lovingly tells us to have no fear. And they saw no one but only Jesus. And oh, I pray that's true for you today, that no matter what you're facing or whatever uh, you are up against right now, that you could look and just see Jesus and be able to place your faith and trust and confidence in him, not in and of yourselves, but in his glory, his might, his power. That's exactly what God called the disciples to do. As they'd seen more and more, as they'd witnessed, as he's revealed himself more and more throughout the course of time, that they grew in their faith. They saw only Jesus. And then just the, the aftermath here, if you will, verses 9 through 13. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. So Jesus is saying, This really is done for your benefit. When you are going to see me hanging on a cross, lifeless and limp, and you're going to be tempted to think, What in the world happened? Was any of this true? How can this be? Remember this moment, men. One of significance. And the disciples asked him, then why do the scribes say first Elijah should come? And Jesus answered, Elijah does come and he will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has come and they didn't recognize him. And they did to him whatever they pleased. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking about John the Baptist. You know, John the Baptist was recognized as a great prophet at first too. But before long, he was arrested and imprisoned and even beheaded, put to death by King Herod. And in a similar way, many people would recognize Jesus as a great prophet and they would follow him. And when he's doing free meals for thousands of people, when he's healing your children or your grandchildren, boy, Jesus sounds like a good guy to be around. But sadly, many would not accept him as the Son of God and the promised Messiah. And finally, what happened to John the Baptist would also happen to Jesus. They would arrest him and put him to death. And so clearly Jesus is speaking to his disciples about his impending suffering and death. But the disciples were so caught up in the popular ideas about the Messiah and the kingdom that they could not believe Jesus, they could not believe Jesus in what he was saying. And later they would remember and be assured of everything that Jesus had told them ahead of time and how that did take place according to God's plan. And that Jesus really was the Messiah, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. I think there's applications for us today. And there's multiple ones, and maybe you'll think of others as you're driving home today or this afternoon. Uh, but just a couple that came to my mind. Uh, you know, I think there's a danger in always looking for signs or experiences. You know, and that's why... Our New Testament reading from 2 Peter is of such importance because Peter was there. Peter was the one who saw Moses and Elijah and Jesus. Peter was the one who dropped to the ground. And yet Peter said, we saw his majestic glory. We heard that voice from heaven. But he says, we have something even more sure in verse 19. We have the prophetic word. We have God's word to which you would do well to pay attention as a lamp that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Peter didn't point people back and say, you know what, uh, look for those signs and wonders. Just like I had a great sign and experience, you need to be looking for a great sign and experience and wonder as well. Peter didn't point them to that, but he pointed them to God's word. 
God's word would be the way in which their faith would be created and sustained. You know, and perhaps you're thinking, you know, Pastor, I, I read the Bible or I do devotions and I just don't seem to get anything out of it. Um, I need something bigger, flashier. You know, that, that might be perhaps that we're reading God's word then with perhaps not the right understanding or goal or aim. If we're thinking that we're going to read something and it's always going to be about me or my three favorite people, me, myself, and I, that's usually not the way God's word works. And if it does point to something in us, sometimes it points out sin, areas in our life that we need to be convicted of, things that we need to confess to God, things that need to be changed. But God's word, first and foremost, always points us to Jesus. It points us to his love for you, his forgiveness that he offers to you, and how he longs to create and sustain that faith in your life, that eternal home in heaven. But it always directs us to God. And so I want to encourage you in that. And maybe if you're reading God's word and you just seem to struggle, maybe shoot me an email or a text. I'd like to visit with you about that. Or maybe we can work and find some devotional readings that would be helpful and beneficial for you. But we are always pointed and directed back to God's word. Because experiences, and as wonderful as they are, they fade over the course of time. But it's God's word that's here and now, available for you yesterday and today and always. We're reminded, too, that God reveals himself to us through his word. And that bit by bit, day by day, we continue to grow in our faith. And in the same way, it's kind of interesting to go back and look at pictures and pictures of my kids and see how they grow and change over time. Interesting to look at pictures of your kids, you know, and even to go back and kind of look and see, I was going through the list of baptisms and the list of confirmation students, and I'm thinking about your kids and your grandkids and how they've grown, even in four and five and six years that I've been here. But that growth doesn't happen overnight, but it's bit by bit, day by day, week by week. And by God's grace... And his goodness, that's the same way he longs to help us grow. Bit by bit over the course of time. And you might not think, man, I've really grown a lot in my faith since last Tuesday. I suppose it's quite possible you could feel the opposite. Man, I'm really in a rut. I don't feel like I'm very close to God at all. And yet the promise of his word and his presence and his power helps us to grow in our faith and understanding. So that we too can be like Peter. Peter and James, and John. Not because we had a big, bold experience that no one else had, but because we spent time in God's word and allowed the Holy Spirit to help us grow in our faith and understanding, to assure us and to hold us firm in those convictions that we believe in God, and that he has things in control. And I think from a spiritual standpoint, we need that. I think we need that even just from a practical standpoint. A number of you have told me how you watch the news and you just go, oh my goodness, I don't even want to watch the news anymore or read the paper. So many things that are depressing, so many things that make me just feel like so many things are out of control. God has everything under control. We talked about that yesterday in our men's Bible study, that uh, there is no element of creation that throws God by surprise, that he has everything in the palm of his hand, everything is in his control. We need that assurance too, don't we? As we look around us, we face different fears or uncertainties. We need that solid assurance that God is in control, that he's in charge, and we can rest in him. I pray today that you have that assurance, that you have that same testimony as Peter, that we would do well to continue to focus and look to God's word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word always points us to Jesus. Just as the disciples were pointed to him, in a mighty and a miraculous way in the transfiguration with what they saw, but also what they heard from you, that voice in heaven. I pray that we would be continually guided and directed and pointed and maybe even lovingly grabbed and put back on the right path or pushed towards you. God, we're prone to wander, prone to stray, uh, prone to focus on all the things that, that can cause us worry and concern and fear. But we pray that uh, we would be drawn again to you, that we'd find comfort and assurance in your goodness and your mercy in your love for us and in your glory. God, we look forward to that day that we live and reign with you in heaven for all eternity. We thank you that your kingdom is a gracious kingdom even now, that you live and reign in our hearts 
in our homes, in our families, and in your church. Help us to see that glory today and to be encouraged by that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to sermon audio from Living Word Free Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. For more information about our congregation, please visit livingwordfreelutheran.org. To go straight to more sermon recordings, simply visit livingwordfreelutheran.org slash sermons.